Hello everybody and welcome to today's video. My name is Bruno, I'm a co-founder at Ironclad Asset Management and I'm also a PhD candidate at WITS. My co-author, Professor Christo Aret and I were really happy to hear that our work has been published in the latest edition of the Investment Analysts Journal. And so we thought it might be a good idea to summarize the high level findings in video format for you today. If you find these types of strategies interesting and would like to learn more about them, please get in touch. But for now, I'd like to invite you to sit back, relax, and let's get into it. Our starting point is that most long-term orientated investors hold equities, and this is for good reason. Global equities have delivered attractively high returns over time. In this case, we consider the US S&P 500 index. It represents the world's largest single market, and we look at it from December 1999 to June 2023, which is the period under investigation in our study. An important point that most investors will be familiar with is that there can be no excess returns without risk. To quote Corey Hofstein, no pain, no premium. Here we show the peak to trough drawdowns in the S&P 500 index over time. You will note that equity often suffers drawdowns in excess of 20%, and sometimes as deep as 50% during market crises. We call these truly deep drawdown episodes tail events, meaning that they don't happen very often, but when they do, they're highly impactful. Generally speaking, investors make use of diversification as their first line of defense against these events, holding other assets such as government bonds with the hope of mitigating the worst of these events without sacrificing too much expected return over time. To do this, however, investors would need to dilute their equity. That is, they'd need to sell out of some of the equity they hold in order to generate the cash needed to purchase other assets such as bonds. And that brings us to the point of our study. We hypothesize that investors could diversify their equity holdings not only by holding other asset classes such as government bonds, but by holding other strategies as well. The strategies had to perform two key functions. First, add returns over time. Second, mitigate equity risk. But how could something that mitigates risk simultaneously add return over time? The reason lies simply in better compounding. The reason for this lies in the combined strategy losing less in times of crisis and reinvesting hedging gains into equity in anticipation of subsequent recovery. In short, better compounding. Another key advantage of using strategies to diversify your equity exposure is that many of them can be incorporated as overlays meaning that you don't need to necessarily dilute your equity exposure in order to gain access to the risk mitigating strategies. Let's make this practical. An investor might allocate part of their equity, say 20%, to a tail risk manager. The tail risk manager could then replicate the same 20% in equity exposure by using cash efficient and liquid equity futures contracts. Provided the tail risk manager held enough cash margin in reserve to back the replicated equity exposure, they could then use the rest of the cash to invest in risk mitigating strategies. The net result for the investor is that the same equity exposure is held before and after the allocation, meaning that no equity dilution took place. On the plus side, they're left with newly minted exposure to risk mitigating strategies. We ended up going with two strategies that we thought synergized really well together and with equity. If you'd like more detail in terms of the actual methodologies used to create these strategies, please follow the link in the description box below. The first strategy we selected was an options-based strategy which covered our equity exposure against only the most significant of crashes using very far out the money put options. The most attractive feature of this strategy is that historically, it's offered really explosive payoffs in sudden crash environments. However, it does carry a downside. Because of this explosive payoff during crashes, the strategy practically acts as insurance and thus should be expected to lose capital in isolation over time. This insurance cost is the reason that we are only interested in hedging the most extreme of events, as insuring against more mundane drawdowns would be restrictively expensive. Remember though, even though this strategy is expected to lose money in isolation over time, we care about the overall portfolio effect it brings to our equity. The second strategy is called trend following, and it's one of the more well-researched and popular hedge fund strategies that exist. The strategy invests in futures contracts in some of the largest and most liquid contracts available in global equities, fixed income, currencies, and commodities. 
The strategy buys markets that have been rising in price and sells markets that have been falling in price and profits from a continuation in those trends. What made the strategy particularly interesting to us is that it's delivered its best returns during equity bear markets. And this brings me to why we thought these two approaches would work well together. Tail hedging using options has historically been most effective during very fast equity crash episodes. Trend following, on the other hand, has been most effective during slower, more drawn out equity bear markets. And so we decided to put this to the test. We effectively compared four different portfolios. Equity on its own, equity with a tail risk hedging using options overlay strategy, equity with a trend following overlay, and then equity with a combination of the options-based strategy and trend following. So, after all was said and done, what did we manage to find? Firstly, looking at the long-run simulated returns across all portfolios tested, we found that running a trend following overlay on top of equity did best of all, generating about 2.4% higher return than equity alone. This performance was followed by the combination portfolio, which utilized both overlays and still outperformed equity on an absolute basis. Predictably, the tail hedging using option strategy detracted from performance and did worst overall from a returns point of view. But the returns are only half the story. What about risk enhancement? From a volatility point of view, we saw the inverse order, with tail exhibiting the lowest volatility, trend the highest, and combination in between. However, all portfolios meaningfully improved on equity in terms of drawdown depth and recovery, with a combination portfolio performing best on balance. If we zoom into more risk statistics, we also found that the combination portfolio did best of all. It consistently generated either the lowest or the second lowest tail risk statistics across all measures. Equity alone consistently generated the highest tail risk statistics. Next, we looked at the worst quarterly returns across all portfolios tested as another risk metric. Once again, the familiar order was apparent, with a combination portfolio performing best and equity alone performing worst. Additionally, the overlay portfolios were less negatively skewed than equity and obviously had thinner tails, especially on the left side. Finally, as an efficiency metric, we looked at the Sharpe ratio, which tells us how much excess return we generated per unit of risk, at least when risk was proxied by volatility. Once more, the combination portfolio did best and equity worst, but the trend following overlay portfolio had a really impressive showing as well. So in conclusion, we were interested to find out whether adding an options-based tail risk hedging strategy and a trend following strategy could add value to an equity standalone portfolio. We tested this by overlaying these strategies both in isolation and in combination on top of a standalone equity portfolio, meaning that across all portfolios tested, you had the same 100% equity exposure and the difference came in the overlays. Our findings suggest that the overlays were not only able to improve on the risk profile of the equity portfolio, but perhaps surprisingly, the return profile as well. We hope that our work has contributed to the existing literature, which often spends time comparing trend following with option-based techniques in terms of bringing a risk mitigating strategy to an equity portfolio. With a simple conclusion, why not both? If you've made it this far into the video, I'd like to thank you very much for your time. We'd be very interested in hearing your feedback or answering any questions you may have about this strategy or any other. I'd like to invite you to follow the link in the description to our website to get in touch. Thank you, and I'll see you in the next one.